Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Alumni Spotlight. Uh, my name is Judy Jenkins. I'm an Associate Professor of Chemistry here at EKU and I get to be our moderator this evening. Um, tonight we're going to catch up with one of our EKU alumni, Dr. Tracy Prater. I will introduce her briefly and then she'll share a presentation letting us uh, get to know her a bit and giving us a peek into her work. There will be time at the end for question and answers. And so to help facilitate that, you'll be able to start submitting questions um, from now using the chat function in whatever platform uh, you're working in. So please go ahead and send us your questions whenever you have those and we'll get to uh, those that we can at the end of the show. So let's get started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Tracy Prater. Tracy graduated from EKU in 2006 and currently works as an engineer at NASA. Among her many accolades, Tracy was recognized as the inaugural EKU College of Science Award winner in 2017 and with the EKU Alumni Award in 2023. Uh, Tracy, on behalf of all of us here at EKU, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to campus virtually um, and we look forward to learning more about your work. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so excited uh, to speak to this group um, and to just talk about uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing at NASA currently. Perfect. Well, we're excited to learn more about it. So to get us started, uh, tell us a bit about yourself. What initially sparked your interest in STEM? Sure. Uh, so I grew up in Perry County, Kentucky. Um, and as a kid, I just always loved reading. Um, so my introduction to science, I think, initially was through books. Um, I always remember loving books about science, whether that was ocean life or space, um, books on nature and, and wildlife. Um, I also watched a lot of uh, movies and documentaries about science, I read a lot of science fiction uh, I, think, I think to some extent, you know, everyone working in the space industry may be here in part due to science fiction inspiration. Uh, I also had some some really good teachers along the way. Uh, I had a fantastic high school math teacher who really encouraged me uh, to pursue STEM as a career. Uh, also had a great middle school science teacher 
um, who had a young astronauts club at our school um, and also really inspired me to, to just learn more about science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, so when I was in high school, I went to Governor Scholars, um, which is a program in the state of Kentucky for rising seniors, where you spend about six weeks on a college campus. Um, I was at EKU, and that was really my introduction to engineering. I was an engineering major at Governor Scholars. Um, but, you know, I, I talk about kind of STEM, and, and I was interested in STEM. Uh, but I've always been a humanities person at heart, too. Um, like I said, I've always loved reading, loved writing. Um, also, and I'm a pianist and play music. Um, so even, even while pursuing STEM, I've never stopped uh, doing, doing any of that. Uh, and a lot of my, my job, you know, today is, is reading and writing and communicating. Um, and so even if you're a STEM student, I kind of encourage uh, students not to forget where the English department is, um, you know, lean into, lean into those humanities classes because those are also extremely uh, beneficial. Excellent. So tell us about your path from EKU to NASA. What did that look like? Sure. Um, so I was a physics major at EKU. Um, and I, th I think in choosing a major, I was obviously really influenced by books. Um, so I had read quite a bit of Carl Sagan. Um, that was a strong influence in me pursuing physics. Um, kind of thought that would be, be a good fit for me um, as an undergraduate major. Uh, so as I was going through the physics program, um, I kind of found that I liked the engineering classes I took as part of a physics degree. Uh, more than more than just the pure physics. Um, so, you know, college is about exploration. It's about figuring out what you want to do and, and what's a good fit for you. Um, so when I was a senior, I started thinking about, um, you know, either going into medical physics or going to graduate school in engineering. Um, I had the opportunity to go and shadow someone in medical physics. Um, and kind of had the realization that I'm a hypochondriac and I don't like hospitals. Uh, so that was, that was probably not the, not the best fit for me, but I really had just a, a passion and interest in space and space exploration always. Um, and, uh, pursuing engineering in graduate school seemed like potentially a, a path to a career in that. Um, so I went to Vanderbilt uh, for graduate school where I studied mechanical engineering. Um, so I got my master's and my PhD there. Um, and I started when I was in graduate school, I applied for a NASA internship. Uh, I got an internship at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, which is in Huntsville, Alabama, um, which is where I currently work. Uh, so I came here and spent a summer working on life support for the International Space Station. Uh, and then later I got a NASA Graduate Student Research Fellowship. So I came back here for another three summers as an intern, uh, working primarily uh, with like metal manufacturing processes, welding processes for aerospace. Um, so I just had really good NASA um, student experiences. Um, so once I, you know, got my PhD, um, I, you know, started applying for jobs. I got a job at United Launch Alliance, uh, which is a rocket company. Uh, they manufacture rockets that launch Department of Defense satellites, NASA satellites. Um, and I worked there for about 18 months, was applying for NASA jobs, eventually, um, got a job at offer at NASA Marshall uh, in materials, which is where I'd done a lot of my, my internships. Um, so then I, you know, wound up at NASA um, and have had a lot of great NASA experiences. Um, I think we have, like, if you could pull up the slides, Alex, I have kind of a photo scrapbook and I'll talk through some of the things that I've worked on at NASA. Excellent. Thank you so much. And while, while that is coming up, um, can you tell us a little bit too about your current job, your current role? 
Yeah. Um, so my current job, I'm in the Habitation Systems Development Office, and I work on next generation um, space habitats. Um, so that means what comes after the International Space Station. We'll talk more about that in, in the presentation, uh, but we have the International Space Station currently. Um, it will be going away at some point, deorbiting. Um, so what comes after that, whether that's in low Earth orbit or on the lunar surface, Mars habitation as well. Um, so that's, that's my current role. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Looks like we've got people from all over. Thank you all for letting us know where you're from. And, and again, please feel free to, to uh, send us your questions as you have those. Okay. Alex, do you have slides for us? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, so I talked through some of this in the intro, uh, but I did include some, some photo scrapbooks, uh, just some pictures from from growing up and different things I've been involved in with my career to date. Um, I'd mentioned, you know, I had a middle school science teacher. Can you go back one slide? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, that's me in the Young Astronauts Club in probably the early 90s, <laughs> I think, wearing some delightful star spangled shorts in that picture. Um, yeah, there's me graduating from EKU in 2006, uh, and then at my PhD graduation, uh, which was in uh, 2012. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so we can touch on some of the things that I've worked on at NASA to date. Um, so I've been at NASA about 10 years. Um, a lot of my work when I was in materials was with the in-space manufacturing projects. So that was focused on how we use space station to demonstrate manufacturing technology so that someday on space missions, we can produce parts and supplies on demand rather than bring everything from Earth. Um, so we flew the first 3D printer to the International Space Station, a recycling payload. We're working on a metal manufacturing technology demonstration um, for ISS as well. Um, another activity I worked in materials. Um, you'll hear more about the space launch system in my talk. Um, but I worked on the multi-stage adapter for that, which houses um, a number of CubeSats that were deployed on the very first space launch system launch in 2022. Um, so that's a picture of me with that hardware, which I actually got to sign um, before it shipped to Kennedy Space Center for integration. Um, some other pictures, I, I did get to go to the Artemis One Space Launch System launch in 2022, uh, which was very exciting. Um, and then let's see, there's the Space Launch System core stage at Marshall Space Flight Center. Marshall did a lot of the development work for space launch system and testing. Um, and then I worked a number of 3D printing projects, um, including large scale 3D printing for habitation. Um, so that bottom right picture is a, a, print, a 3D printed habitat competition. Um, we had a few years ago through NASA's prizes and competition program, and that is the, the winning 3D printed habitat uh, in that picture. Okay, next chart. Yeah, and then just a little bit about me kind of outside of work. Um, I have two dogs you can see on the chart, uh, Laika and Clementine. Both of them are beagle mixes. Um, I love to travel. I love to scuba dive. Um, I, my husband also works at NASA. He is a software engineer uh, doing mostly app development. Okay, so that brings us to uh, talking about my current work uh, and then what might come next for uh, habitation. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, so, so what is a habitat? Very simply put, a habitat is a home in space. Um, so I took the, this definition of habitat 
from National Geographic. Uh, so habitat meets all the environmental conditions an organism needs to survive, right? So habitats are about providing everything that humans need to live and function and be healthy and happy and able to execute um, the, their space mission. Um, so what do you need to survive? There's a list um, on the slide. So you need air, right? You don't just need air. You need a certain mix of oxygen and nitrogen. You need water. You need food. Um, your habitat also provides protection from the environment. Um, you need to exercise a little bit more on that later in the talk. Um, have to have an ability to communicate with Earth and mission control, right? This is not in any way a comprehensive list, um, but just kind of a first cut at, at all the functions that a habitat has to provide from a human perspective. Okay, next chart. Okay, so this is the how needy are humans slide. Um, so this comes from a, a number of NASA documents, um, but kind of giving you an idea of what each crew member needs per day on a mission. Um, so about five pounds of food per day, that may seem like a lot. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that the crew also exercise for about two hours each day, uh, six pounds of, of drinking water each day. Um, the food for space is actually mostly dehydrated so water has to be added to that so to water um, to hydrate the food as well um, you have to have systems that provide oxygen and generate oxygen um, one of the things that we take for granted on earth is that we exhale carbon dioxide and nature just scrubs that out of the atmosphere for us um, when we're in an enclosed environment on a space mission, we have to have systems that will remove carbon dioxide um, from the atmosphere in our enclosed environment. Um, you also need clothing. Um, interestingly, clothing, um, you know, on space missions, on the International Space Station, um, is disposable. It is worn until it no longer passes the smell test and then it becomes trash. Um, and then you also have to manage the trash that's being produced. Um, so there's a module that comes to the International Space Station called the Cygnus module, which is really the space garbage truck. Um, so all the trash on space station gets packed into, um, you know, what are kind of called trash footballs. Um, and then they go into the Cygnus and the Cygnus burns up on reentry. But, you know, how you manage the trash is, is also an important consideration for habitation. Okay, next slide. So beyond just, you know, how do we provide human needs and, and meet human needs? Here are some challenges that illustrate why space habitation is really hard. Um, so some of these aren't necessarily technology challenges. These are limits of, of human biology. Um, so, you know, one preeminent hazard for human space law is radiation and exposure to radiation. Um, so in low Earth orbit, which is about 200 miles above the Earth, um, you're still somewhat shielded by the Earth's magnetic field. Um, as you move farther beyond low Earth orbit, radiation increases dramatically. Um, so if you're on space station, you might be getting a radiation dose that's equivalent to about one X-ray a day. As you move into deep space, um, think about a Mars mission, that radiation level might increase to something closer to one CT scan a day. Um, so there are radiation limits on the dose that the crew can be exposed to over their lifetime based on how much that dose would increase their lifetime risk of, of cancer. Um, so with habitation, we obviously have to design systems, um, use materials that can shield um, for radiation, um, and then also consider mission durations, environments to stay within those radiation limits. Um, so isolation and confinement, hostile closed environments are very similar challenges. Uh, so many of us spent a lot of time in our house 
uh, probably during the part of COVID-19 where there weren't vaccines, right? So did you find that to be, you know, that isolation and confinement and, and limitations on human interaction to be psychologically challenging? Yes, I think most most everyone did. Um, so space is, is somewhat, you know, similar to that, right? You're living in a confined environment. Um, you know, you can't just walk outside and, and go for a walk. Um, that can be, you know, psychologically challenging. Um, you're essentially living, you know, a space station and essentially living in a, in a metal tube for a year plus. Um, distance from Earth is another one that's, that's a big challenge um, for, for something like a Mars mission, you could see up to a 20 minute communications delay. So imagine if you're on this mission and you need to talk to mission control to help troubleshoot something, right? It could take 20 minutes for that message to get there. Um, and then maybe they figure out some solution on the ground, want to communicate a procedure back to you, it would take 20 minutes um, for, for that information to return to you. Um, so the current way we operate um, doesn't really work in that scenario. Um, so, so that's another challenge that kind of drives us more toward autonomous systems or we're less reliant on ground control and the, the crew actually have decision support tools and the, and the ability to, to make their own decisions. Um, there's also a lot of physiological changes that come with putting humans in a microgravity environment. Um, so in the absence of gravity, you will lose bone, your muscles will atrophy, uh, fluid in your body will shift upward and that can cause vision changes. Um, there's also cardiovascular implications for living and working in microgravity. Um, so that's another thing with habitation, you have to have um, you know, countermeasures um, to, to combat some of these physiological changes. Okay, next slide. Um, so kind of looking at the history of space habitation, right? how have we lived and worked in space in the past? Um, so early days, the 60s, metal capsules in the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. Apollo also had a lander um that, that went to the lunar surface um so we evolved from that toward the first u.s orbiting space station which was skylab in the early 70s and so that was really the first uh kind of longer duration missions in low earth orbit um, and a lot of what we know about habitation today the foundation of that is in the skylab program uh, and so then in the early 80s through 2011, we had Space Shuttle. So Space Shuttle was doing, you know, two week missions or so in low Earth orbit. It was used um, to construct the space station as well. Um, and so then, you know, Space Shuttle was used to assemble the space station um, and space station has been our space platform since the first module launched in December 1998. Um, it was fully complete around 2011 with the last space shuttle launch. Um, and so it's, it's been operational for 25 plus years now. Um, and it, it's really just an incredible capability. Um, so we'll talk more about space station on the next slide. Yeah, so as I said, our current home in space is the International Space Station. Um, it took about 12 years to construct, somewhere between 60 to 80 launches using the space shuttle and Russian launch vehicles, uh, depending on what you count as an assembly mission. Uh, so it's about the size of a five bedroom house. Um, so very, very large, um, incredible orbiting laboratory, incredible research capabilities. Um, I like to tell people when I give talks that you can actually go outside and see the space station in the night sky. So there is an app you can download from the NASA app store called spot the station, and it will tell you when you can see a flyover of the space station. Um, it's really cool. It looks like a, 
a very fast moving dot in the sky. It's moving at 17,500 miles per hour. Um, and so we continue to use space station um, to do research. Um, so that research is vast. As you can see there's many, many publications that have come from use of space station, space station facilities. Um, there's a lot of research on protein crystal growth to inform drug development. The microgravity environment is a really unique place um, and an enabling environment to be able to do that kind of research. Everything from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, cancer research, um, water purification systems um, are also one of the key um, kind of research products of space station development. Um, life support systems for enclosed environments. Um, we talked about physiological changes, um, you know, methods to combat muscle atrophy, to combat bone loss. And so those also have earth-based benefits for, for understanding things like osteoporosis. Um, earth observation, right? So the space station in low earth orbit, orbiting the earth once every 90 minutes provides this really unique um, vantage point um, for observing the earth. Um, also for disaster response, there is a, a project on space station called Servir, which is Spanish for to serve. That's been really instrumental in uh, monitoring, you know, disaster, monitoring and enabling a response to, to disasters that happen on earth. Um, so space station is also key as, as, is, as our satellites in low earth orbit to understand um, how our planet is changing. Um, so from the exploration habitation perspective, um, we have a space station in order to enable us to test out technologies that we need for really long duration space travel, really long duration habitation. Um, so a lot of that is human research. You know, we have a deep understanding of how long duration space flight impacts the human body, how we counteract with drug protocols, with exercise. And that's because of these very long space station missions that we've been able to execute. Um, you know, how do we grow food in space, right? Think about a Mars mission that could be up to 1200 days, right? You have to have, a, a, you know, a safe and nutritious food supply. Um, you know, I worked in space manufacturing for a number of years, right? So how do we manufacture things on demand? How do we recycle um, and kind of close the loop so that we don't have to up mass? everything we need in terms of supplies and logistics. Um, life support systems, obviously very, very important um, for future missions, critical systems that are providing oxygen, providing water. Um, and so space station is where we can really test those systems out um, and eventually get to the point where we have kind of closed loop life support where, you know, we don't have to up mass water from earth we can generate oxygen um, you know we can can remove carbon dioxide from the air um, and and reuse that carbon dioxide in other processes um, so space station is is really really critical it's, it's our most important test bed okay next chart uh, but the sad news uh, is space station is going to come to an end eventually. Um, so right now space station will be on orbit until 2030. Um, you know, it is an international partnership, Russia, Japan, many countries in Europe. I think there's 40 plus partner countries who participate in space station. Um, so it's, it's just a fantastic asset, um, but it, it, it has been you know, on orbit for a very long time. Um, and so the goal is that we would have commercial companies who would be able to provide a successor um, to the space station, a commercial low earth orbit platform or platforms um, that NASA would be a user of. We would still be able to test technologies on it. We would still be able to fly government crews to it. Um, and so there's a program called Commercial Low Earth Orbit Destinations 
um, that's focused on how do we see the development of these commercial space platforms um, so that when space station deorbits, we still have a platform in low Earth orbit, ensuring that kind of continuity of operations, that we don't lose our presence in low Earth orbit, that we don't lose our, our test bed there. Um, so there's a program called Commercial Destinations Free, Free Flyer. Uh, so Blue Origin is working under that program. Voyager Space as well, developing platforms um, to potentially serve as, as successors to the International Space Station. Um, and there are a number of other companies working in the commercial low Earth orbit ecosystem. Uh, for example, you may have heard of Axiom, flying private astronaut missions to the International Space Station. Um, so there's just a lot of commercial activity in low Earth orbit to set us up to be ready um, to continue to have those capabilities when space station eventually deorbits. Okay, next chart. Um, so that kind of brings us to the Artemis campaign. Um, so, you know, we talked about how we're going to continue to have a presence in low Earth orbit. We're going to continue to use low Earth orbit as a test bed. But what about going beyond low Earth orbit, right? How do we get to the day where we could live on the moon, where we could have habitats that go to and from Mars, habitats on the surface of Mars? Um, so the Artemis campaign is focused on returning humans to the moon, having a sustainable presence there. Um, so this is different than Apollo. Um, you know, the goal of Apollo essentially was to beat the Russians to the moon, right? Apollo succeeded in doing that. Um, and beyond that, right, it wasn't sustainable. The program's canceled in 1972. Um, so because of the moon is, is our closest neighbor, um, it's about three days away, 240,000 miles. Um, it can be used to develop the technologies that we need to support Mars exploration. Um, so Artemis is also an international endeavor. We talked about how Space Station um, is, a, you know, a vast international partnership. Um, Artemis is similar to that. There's something called the Artemis Accords um, that a number of different countries have signed to contribute um, to make, you know, their contributions to the Artemis campaign. Next chart. Um, so kind of the foundation of the Artemis campaign is the space launch system. So this is essentially a giant moon rocket. It's 212 feet tall. It could lift about 60,000 pounds uh, to the moon. Uh, so this went on its first test flight in 2022. Um, so I was actually at the Artemis one launch. I'd worked on a piece of hardware for this called the multi-stage adapter that housed all the CubeSats that were deployed. Um, so this is this is really key to, to what we're trying to do going forward. Um, so on top of the space launch system is the Orion capsule. The test fly in 2022 did not have humans on board. Uh, but next slide, uh, the 2025 launch. Uh, which is Artemis 2, will have humans on board. Uh, and so that's going to send four crew uh, to orbit the moon and return to Earth, which is very similar to the Apollo 8 mission. Okay, next chart. And then Artemis 20, or, or Artemis 3, uh, which would be in the 2026 timeframe, um, would be the first human landing on the moon since 1972. Uh, and so the landing vehicle for Artemis 3 is actually SpaceX Starship, um, which you might have seen or heard or, or seen testing of in the media. Okay, next slide. So as we look to future habitats, um, future habitats on the moon, future habitats on Mars, what are the options um, for those? So this is a framework for how we think about and how we classify habitats. Um, this is a framework developed by NASA. Um, it's from two space architects called Chris Kennedy and Mark Cohen. Um, so, you know, thinking about this, the class one habitat is what we have with International Space Station. It's a series of rigid metallic modules. A lot of the systems that you need can actually launch pre-integrated into the structure. 
uh, class two habitat. We're going to talk a lot more about because that is primarily what our office um, works on is an inflatable structure. Um, so you can pack it um, into the launch vehicle payload fairing and deploy it at the point of use. And what that gives you is a really mass efficient structure. You can get a lot of volume uh, per unit mass. And then class three habitats are habitats that you would manufacture on a planetary surface from the resources that you have available to you, like lunar regolith, or which is essentially lunar soil. Okay, next chart. Um, so as I mentioned, and we'll talk more about, our office works a lot on um, inflatable soft goods materials development. Um, so what are inflatable materials? So this, this shows you the, the typical inflatable material layup. So a lot of people when they hear inflatables, they think about balloons, um, but this is a really complex multi-material system that's really high strength. Um, so you have a bladder layer that actually contains the air um, inside your habitat, typically a polymer material. Um, attached to that is a restraint layer. That's a structural layer. That's usually made of Kevlar or Vectran. Um, that is a really high strength material, right? As strong as a typical metallic when it's in a pressurized state. Um, and the restraint layer, we'll look at some soft goods test articles um, on the next slide, but that's kind of that basket weave pattern of straps and cords that you'll see. Um, you also have to protect against micrometeoroid orbital debris. Uh, so there's a layer to offer protection against that. Um, you have to have, a, you know, a thermal blanket um, to help control temperature. And then if you're in low Earth orbit, um, there's atomic oxygen that can kind of have degradative effects on materials. So you'd have another layer, typically beta cloth. Um, a material called beta claw to protect against that. Um, so inflatables um, are, you know, they're not a new idea. Um, you know, if you go back to the 60s, look at the very first space station concepts, they're actually inflatables. NASA had a lot of work on inflatables in the 60s, including a project with Goodyear uh, to look at how we would use inflatables to potentially extend the duration of the Apollo mission by providing habitation capabilities. Um, the first Russian spacewalk in the 60s was actually out of an inflatable airlock. Um, most of the technology development for inflatable soft goods um, was under a program in the late 1990s, early 2000s called TransHab. And so TransHab was focused on how do we build and develop an inflatable habitat that could take crew to and from Mars? Um, so that's really kind of the, the genesis of the, the modern day inflatables that, that we see in the commercial sector is the TransHab program um, at NASA. Um, so that technology has transitioned out to the commercial sector um, where it's now being developed. Um, there's actually a inflatable module on the International Space Station um, called the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module or BEAM. It's been there for I think about 10 years, um, but it's not a module that the crew actually live in or spend, um, you know, long duration um, parts of their mission in. It's used for storage and it's a it's a technology demonstration to understand how the material performs in the space environment uh, and what the radiation environment is inside of that inflatable relative to a metallic module. Um, but just kind of emphasizing that, you know, this isn't isn't something totally new. This is something that's been uh, you know in development for for years and years, but but has a lot of potential. Um, to enable higher volume capabilities for future missions. Okay, next chart. Um, so obviously talking about, you know, how these haven't been used in a long duration habitation scenario previously, um, one of the things that NASA has done to help facilitate that is develop certification guidance. So this is answering the question, you know, how do we test these material systems 
to ensure that they're safe for use in these habitation platforms that we may want to to put them in someday. Um, so some of some of the testing that's prescribed is testing of individual layers um, at smaller scales. Some of it's subscale module testing. Some of it's full scale module testing. Um, so it's really about how do you understand the failure modes? What's the long term material performance? Um, so I chose to focus on two tests here because they're actually explosive tests and those are kind of exciting to watch and to watch and talk about. Um, but burst testing is trying to answer the question, you know, what pressure uh, will the inflatable module burst at? Um, and how distant is that from your operating pressure, right? You would want your burst pressure to be way above your operating pressure um, four times that, in fact. Um, and there's creep testing. Um, so creep testing is you're going to hold the module at some percentage of ultimate burst pressure for a longer duration, um, you know, a thousand hours, um, even up to 10,000 hours um, until you have a burst event. Um, so this is very important to kind of understanding, hey, what are the failure modes of these structures? What are the safety factors? Um, how do we design and operate them such that we don't see these failure modes in a service scenario? Um, so Marshall, where I work, we have a lot of um, really unique and, and one of a kind in the world, even testing capabilities. Um, and so we have developed very unique testing capabilities for inflatable soft goods in our test area, which commercial companies are now making use of. I have some images of some tests that have been done um, for Sierra Space in their inflatable soft goods development work. Okay, next chart. Yeah, okay, so 3D frame habitats. Um, I used to work in this area, I get really excited about it. Um, so yes, you can 3D print habitats. Um, there are actually companies on earth um, right now who do 3D printing of large scale structures, including 3D printing of homes. Um, so you can formulate feedstocks or the materials that you can print with that use basalt, that use lunar regolith, um, that use concretes that rely less on water in the formulation or don't have any water at all. Um, so, so that's really key um, for the class three habitats that I talked about, where you're actually building structures on a surface using indigenous resources. Um, so NASA, NASA did a 3D printed habitat competition. Um, you can see the winning design and prototype from that competition in the lower right corner. Um, but, you know, there's some supporting technologies that go along with this excavation for site preparation um, and then outfitting, which is kind of how you turn a house into a home, so to speak. Um, OK, next slide. Um, so coming to back to the Artemis campaign, um, so looking toward the moon, um, this is the gateway, the lunar gateway. And so the lunar gateway is going to be a space station, a smaller space station that orbits around the moon. It's going to be in an orbit where it can provide access to all of the moon's surface called a near rectilinear halo orbit. Um, so there's several modules of Gateway. There's a logistics outpost for storage being built by Northrop Grumman. There's an international habitat that's being built by, it, by European Space Agency. Um, there's a Canada arm. Canada's in a lot of robotic arm development for space shuttle and for space station, and that will continue with Gateway. Um, there's a power and propulsion element. Um, so the goal is to have a fully operational gateway um, in lunar orbit by the end of the decade. And so there's the first elements of that, the power and propulsion element, the logistics outpost um, will launch together no earlier um, than, than 2025. Okay, next slide. Um, so talking about, you know, orbiting space station um, in lunar orbit, right? We also like to think about, well, how would we have surface habitats one day? Um, so this is a concept for a lunar surface habitat. 
Um, this is one of the concepts that our office works on. So you can see inflatable soft goods in this design. Um, and we have we also have an animation of this concept that we'll that we'll go through later. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so why why is habitation on the lunar surface? hard in particular. Um, so there, there are a lot of challenges. One of them is just how you deliver mass to the surface. Um, so, you know, with, with a lander, depending on the class and category of lander, you might be constrained to a 25,000 pound mass budget, um, which sounds like a lot, uh, but, but it's actually challenging to meet given all the, the systems that you need to support. Um, dust is a huge challenge for the lunar surface. Um, so lunar dust has a degradative effect on systems. It's also a human health hazard. It can cause silicosis. Uh, another challenge with lunar surface habitation is we're going to have these very long periods of dormancy um, where your habitat could not have crude at all. Um, so it could be up to three years of dormancy, and, and that is so different from International Space Station, right, which has crew on it continuously. Um, so designing systems for dormancy is, is a large challenge. Um, you know, the, the moon experiences periods of illumination and periods of darkness. Um, and during those periods of darkness, which could be as long as two weeks, right, you could see temperatures dip to like negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so you have to have battery systems that can help your habitat survive the lunar night. You have to have, you know, systems that themselves can survive those kind of temperatures. So that's also really difficult. Um, another thing that's not on that chart, this chart, um, is that we anticipate for exploration habitation, we're going to have higher oxygen environments than we have relative to space station. Um, and that's to reduce, um, to, to maximize the, the time that crew can go on spacewalks. Um, they do something called a pre-breathe, where they breathe in 100% oxygen um, to, present, to prevent decompression illness, right? buildup of nitrogen in the, in the blood and tissues. Um, we also worry about decompression illness with scuba diving. Um, so operating in a higher oxygen environment can reduce pre-breathe time, but it's a different environment than space station. Um, and if we're using space station systems, right, um, they may not have been designed for that higher oxygen environment. Also, flammability becomes a concern when you go to higher oxygen levels. Okay, next chart. Yeah, I'm going to close with this one. Um, so this is the, the Mars is hard slide. Mars is orders of magnitude harder than anything else that we've talked about. Um, so one of the challenges is just the mission duration. Um, so depending on where the planets are in relation to each other, when you launch, um, you could be looking at up to a 1,200-day uh, mission. Um, so that's, again, that's longer than anything that we've done on space station today, right? The current longest space station mission is a little over a year. Um, so again, we're, we're expecting you know, to not have a spares resupply chain, right? We're developing technologies like in space manufacturing, um, but right currently, you know, those, those capabilities are still in a technology development phase. Um, so that's very difficult to think about, well, I have to bring everything I would ever need with me, right? That's why we, um, yeah, that's the potential mission benefit of, of technologies like on-demand manufacturing. Um, it's just the reliability and maintainability of systems over that length of mission with really no abort capability. Uh, communication delays and blackouts. We talked about the 20 minute communication delay you would experience with a Mars mission. Um, there's also periods of what's called solar conjunction which is when the sun is between the Earth and Mars. And so during those periods, which are predictable, right, but you have a, communi a total communications blackout. Um, and so right now when we do spaceflight operations, right, you have 
constant communication with mission control on earth. If something goes wrong, you know, there's a person sitting on a console for that particular system. There's a back room full of people to figure out what's going on with that system and troubleshoot it. Um, and we're just not going to be able to, you know, adapt that for, for a Mars mission. Um, so we really need autonomy. We need earth independent operation where the crew are able to make these kind of decisions and have decision support that's, that's automated versus dependent on ground communication. Um, yeah, and then just the human health and performance considerations like isolation and confinement, right, for a 1,200-day mission. Um, that takes some some mental right stuff to be able to do that in addition to just the, the physiological changes we talked about earlier. Um, so I think I will close with that, and then we have some really cool animations that we can go through. Um, so this is the concept for the lunar surface habitat. Um, again, this is not baselined into any sort of main to Mars architecture. This is just a concept under study and trade. Uh, but you can see the, the inflation of the soft goods module, the habitat being offloaded from a lander in this rendering. And then crew conducting extravehicular activities in near the habitat um, and then this is a, an image of you know having a 3d printer inside your habitat for on-demand manufacturing and then this is the mars transit habitat um, so you would have some sort of propulsion system propulsion systems are currently under trade you could have nuclear electric propulsion nuclear thermal propulsion solar electric propulsion or chemical propulsion um, and all of those have their, their unique challenges and benefits. Um, this is an example of a three-story layout um, for the transit habitat design, which again, um, you know, in this particular concept is also inflatable soft goods. Um, that's a spacewalk from the transit hab and then um, arriving at, at Mars. And the last slide um, is just a video of a pressure test or a burst test that we recently performed at Marshall for Sierra Space. Um, so that is their full scale habitat. Again, this test is to determine the ultimate burst pressure um, to compare that with the operating pressure to verify that you have an adequate factor of safety. That was actually the very first um pneumatic full-scale test of an inflatable soft goods module in the in the history of inflatable soft goods development um, so like i said marshall just has some really um just world-class testing capabilities and, and a, a long heritage of doing um a lot of propulsion testing um, so we've been able to tap into that expertise and that heritage and those facilities um, to be able to do some really innovative soft goods work. Uh, so it went a little bit long, um, but hopefully gave you some good, good food for thought on, um, you know, what we might do next in the, in the world of space habitation. Uh, Tracy, thank you so much. I think we're all ready to go, go with you in this adventure. <laughs> all right. um, all right, so we've got lots of questions, and so I will I will read some of those to you, and and feel free to to modify or whatever, um, okay. tell us what you can. Um, so you've been speaking about the soft goods. Mark Hunter asked, um, how long does it take to develop a soft good to the point that it's ready for testing? Yeah. Um, so as I said, Rod, it's it's something that's been in development for for a very very long time um since since the 60s really um the companies who are currently working inflatable soft goods with us they're doing that under a broad agency announcement um, which is a, a contract mechanism um, that was set up i think around 2015. Um, so again they're they're at the point now where they have soft goods architectures and they're taking it through those um that stepwise progression of tests that nasa has outlined in the in the certification document um so you know it, it really depends on the levels of funding that are available the pace at which a, 
a company is is developing their their soft goods architecture um and it kind of depends on um you know for future missions um you know, if we were going to use inflatable soft goods as an option, what our timelines would be for that kind of a, it depends, it depends answer. Um, yeah, but the, the inflatable soft goods document, it's in my references, uh, but that's publicly available online. So you can take a look at um, all the, it's, it's really extensive testing. And, um, you know, some of those tests are really, really long duration. In particular, there's a module level creep test um, that's recommended. Creep is where you hold it at pressure for a really long duration to understand deformation in the material when you might have a burst event. Um, and that's a 10,000 hour test. Um, so you could have a module, you know, under testing for, for, you know, in, in some cases, several years. Excellent. And I should have mentioned these slides will be posted in the, and this uh, video will be available. So for those of you interested in looking at the references or looking back at this, these will be made available to you. So related to the soft goods question, Alex asked us, uh, how do we determine what initiatives are better suited for private corporations um, and, and versus the government, government agencies like NASA, et cetera? How do we make a decision about who does what? Yeah, so, so NASA historically, and this continues to be the case, um, has done a lot of technology development um, and as a government agency, we develop technologies and then we transition those technologies to the private sector. Um, so NASA is currently in a model where we're using a lot of public private partnerships um, and technology transfer is, is really key to that. Um, but what we've seen in probably the past 10 years is a transition to NASA relying more on the commercial sector. Um, we, there was a program that started um, in the 2000s throughout the commercial cargo program. So this is where NASA would invest in commercial companies like SpaceX developing launch vehicles. Um, and then those companies would be able to provide transportation services to space station for cargo. Um, and then there was also the commercial crew program, right? So that was funding SpaceX and Boeing to be able to provide um, astronaut transport to and from the International Space Station. So again, NASA is investing in that, but they're not going to own or they're not going to operate the rockets. They're going to be users of those capabilities. Um, and so SpaceX, um, I think, is on their ninth. Um, astronaut mission to the ISS currently under commercial crew, um, Boeing Starliner is going to launch with its first human mission, the space station, no earlier than May of this year. Um, so, you know, as we think about like future habitation platforms, right, I talked about the commercial lower orbit destinations program. Um, that's kind of the model for that as well. Um, is that you might have companies using technologies that NASA has developed, like life support technologies, um, you know, leveraging all the, the good work that NASA has done over the many years on technology development. But NASA is not going to build these platforms. They're not going to own and operate the platforms, but they're going to use them, right, as, as technology test beds the same way we do That's with Space Station also. Um, you know, have government crews on board doing doing science, um, learning how to how to live and, and work in space and and doing more kind of human research on effects of microgravity. Um, so I, th I think it's, you know, we, we are moving in some ways to a model where we're relying more on the, the private sector to develop the assets own and, own and operate the assets. Excellent. All right. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, how people can get related experiences. So this question okay. is from Maggie Abney. She says, thank you for spending your evening with us. I'm nine, nine years old and like to write stories about space travel. I'm going to space camp in Huntsville for the first time this summer. Do you have any advice for me? Yeah, well, it's very exciting that you're coming to, me to Huntsville. Um, I'm coming live to you from Huntsville tonight. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think my best advice would just be to to lean into all the experiences um, that you get to have as a student uh, growing up. Really, just being able to explore what your interests are, what you like, what you don't like, um, and how you might shape those into into some sort of career. Um, so yeah, just kind of soak up experiences. Excellent. So moving a little bit along the age spectrum, um, Michael Earl Hay asked us for EKU students who might be interested to participate uh, in an internship experience at NASA, what does that process look like? What, what do students need to do and what types of opportunities might be available? Yeah, um, so I was an intern for four summers, uh, once through the kind of the regular internship program, and then three summers through a fellowship that included um, what's called a visiting technologist experience. Um, so you can apply for internships um, through it's intern.nasa.gov. Um, and so it's a very streamlined website now. Um, it's kind of a one stop shopping initiative, I think is the acronym, acronym they use. Um, so you can put in one application and apply to as many internship opportunities as you want across the entire agency. Um, so NASA has 10 field centers um, scattered across the country, all working on different facets of aeronautics and space exploration. Um, and so, yeah, you can apply there. You can you can do an internship in spring, summer, or fall. Uh, unfortunately, our internship deadline for summer has actually closed now, um, but there'll be a, another round of applications um, for fall internships. Um, and so, yeah, I highly highly recommend NASA internships. We're very key in me, you know, continuing to be engaged in the in the space industry and ultimately coming to work here. Um, and and then for graduate school, right? There's also fellowship opportunities through the NASA Space Grant Consortium, through the NASA Space Technologies Graduate Research Opportunities program. Um, so, so just lots of, lots of student opportunities. Um, there's also a volunteer intern program. Um, I'll have to get a link for that. Um, but yeah, I had a volunteer intern uh, one semester who was virtual. The downside of that is you don't get paid, um, but, but all the government agencies have a, have a volunteer intern program as well. Uh, so there are many, many, many opportunities. Um, you do have to be, for, for most of the NASA centers, um, in particular Marshall, because we're working on a military base, you do have to be a, a U.S. citizen. Um, there are minimum GPA requirements as well. Um, in addition to, to the NASA internship programs, we also have something called Pathways Internships. Uh, and so the Pathways Internships are more like a co-op program where you're in school, but sometimes you'll take a semester off to come do a 16-week internship. Uh, the Pathways Opportunities go through usajobs.gov. Um, and so those opportunities are actually a pipeline program where at the end of your completion of three rotations, um, you're eligible to be offered a full-time civil servant position. Excellent. And so, so Reagan Simpson asks us, um, what's the best way to get non-space people interested and educated about the importance of space exploration? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think NASA social media and the NASA public affairs people do a great job. Um, so NASA social, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, every NASA field center also has social media accounts. Many of the NASA programs and projects have their own individual social media accounts that you can follow, including Space Launch System, including the Lunar Gateway that I talked about, Artemis Campaign. Uh, so that's a really great way, I think, to kind of stay connected uh, with the work of the agency. One thing I, I do want to emphasize, though, is that in the space industry, it is so much more than just STEM. Um, you know, we have public affairs people, we have lawyers, we have, uh, you know, resource analysts who are more like business people, we have business development offices. Um, it, you know, my husband does IT and app development. Um, there's, um, 
you know, media and, and graphics designers. NASA has its own TV channel. Um, so there's just many, many things that you could you could be involved with, even you know, if you're not in a in a STEM field. Um, and I've worked with people with such a you know diversity of backgrounds. People who have English degrees, people who have journalism degrees, um, people who are medical doctors, right? Who all who all work in the in the space industry. Excellent. So let's let's think a little bit about your time in college. Um, so as you look, as you reflect back on your time in college, is there specific knowledge obtained or skills learned from college that you continue to use? Yeah, when I think about just the classes I took over the whole course of my academic career, um, I've as as just a discipline, I've always found statistics to be very beneficial. Um, a lot of, I'm in a project management office now, and a lot of what we do is kind of manage risk in development efforts and try to understand risk and what we need to fund, what activities we need to fund to mitigate those risks downstream. Uh, and I think statistics is really key to, to being able to do that kind of risk informed decision making and understanding like what's the based on the information you have what's the likelihood of this occurring what are the consequences of it occurring uh and then taking that information and deciding um you know how likely it is to be an issue downstream and, and then what steps you're you're ultimately going to take and and implement um english and literature writing uh, all all really important um, so I, I was in engineering at Marshall up until about three years ago, and then I moved to a, to a project management office. But, but everything um, that I've done in engineering, right, I had to write and publish and um, just be, be able to write proposals. Um, so being able to communicate your ideas is really, really important. Um, so I think the the humanities and, and the English classes are also very key to being able to do that. Excellent. Um, so, so Rusty Carpenter, who happens to be an English person, I know, um, was asking if if there was an experience as that you had as an EKU student that sparked your interest in space. Um, I mean, I think that they, like there there are probably a few. Um, I don't know if you call them them turning points that that really made me want to to go into the industry. Um, I think when I was in high school and I had calculus, um, calculus to me at the time seemed like tantamount to magic, right? In particular, uh, you know, equations of motion. Uh, you know, being able to to write equations of motion and understand like this is going to be the velocity of this at this particular time just i mean it's like you can predict the future <laughs> with this in in some ways um and and i think just pairing that with kind of my my interest in space i always saw um you know stem as kind of a conduit to like i could if i did this i could i could probably find a way into the into the space industry. Uh, Governor Scholars, obviously, being, being in engineering as part of that, um, that was my first real insight into what engineers do uh, and what aspects of engineering I might be more interested in versus less interested in. Um, and then just, um, like I saw the last space show launch in 2011, uh, I was an intern at that time and that was the very first launch i had seen that had humans on board so i think just just seeing humans leave the planet for the first time in person and and just you know there were so many people that launched i was on base at kennedy space center um and just the the magnitude of that workforce just struck me as, as just all these people working together to enable this like how how cool would it be to be a part of that just in some small way excellent all right so i'm, I'm gonna wrap us up with a final question 
if you could go back to where the EKU students are now, right? So deciding which courses to take, which majors to pursue, all of that sort of stuff. Um, what advice would you give your your past self, your student self? Yeah, so I, I think about this a lot. <laughs> you know, what I, what I would tell myself um, as, as a young adult, as a high school student, as a college student, as a graduate student. Uh, so one piece of advice, um, would be to have more fun. <laughs> I, I studied a lot. I, I worked a lot. Uh, I, I think that ultimately served me well. Uh, but I think I probably could have had a little, a little more fun and, and still been okay with it. Um, I, and I think too, just practicing. Like I still struggle with this. Like being compassionate towards yourself. I'm very, very hard on myself. I'm never gonna go back and watch this interview <laughs> because I will scrutinize and criticize everything I said during it. Uh, so yeah, just just being able to be a little nicer to myself um, is something I would like to communicate to myself as an undergrad as well, right? If, if you gotta be on a test. It's okay. That's not indicative of kind of your value to the world. Um, but just having that kind of like sense of security uh, in yourself, I think, and your value is, is pretty important. And just being kind to yourself because we're all human. We all make mistakes. Um, you know, we can't, we're all imperfect. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you so much for spending uh, this time with us. It's been fascinating to uh, learn more about what you do. Uh, and then to all of you all that joined us, thank you for tuning in this evening as well. We really, really appreciate your, your interest and your willingness to be with us. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you.